Hey guys, it's Cam here, welcoming you to another episode of The Build Room. In this episode, we're changing things up a bit and we're cutting some rust out of Vila Crumbles. So let's get into it. Okay, so we're gonna change it up a little bit in this episode. We've spent a lot of time uh, dismantling things, uh, grinding, cleaning, and then freshly painting and powder coating parts in the last few episodes. Uh, but I think we need something a little bit different to break things up. So we're gonna tackle the rust that is in the front driver side or right hand side wheel arch. So I noticed that rust in the first couple of episodes, but it didn't seem like it was too bad because it was obscured by a lot of the, uh, the brake master cylinder and fuel lines and bits and pieces and as I've had a look at it a bit more uh, it's pretty clear that there's going to have to be a fairly big piece of metal cut out of there some fresh stuff welded in uh, and then we're going to have to neaten it all up so that it looks 100% or at least as close to 100% as I'm likely to get something. So let's jump into the bay and have a look at what we're working with. Okay, so if you can cast your mind back a few episodes ago when I rebuilt the brake master cylinder, that was actually because there was a problem with the seals in that cylinder and when you're applying the brakes, it was overflowing the fluid reservoir uh, and it obviously wasn't applying the brakes, which sucked, but it also spilled brake fluid out of the reservoirs, down the strut towers uh, and onto the chassis rails. Now that had obviously been happening for quite some time. All of the paint has reacted and basically peeled away, leaving a lot of surface rust on the strut tower. But not only that, there's also a lap joint at the very bottom of the strut tower, right near the chassis rail that without being protected by that paint uh, is basically just a magnet for dirt and water and has rusted out. So now we've got a situation where there's a large section that needs to be cut out and replace with fresh sheet metal. So what I'm gonna to do today is pull the steering box uh, because that's right where I'm gonna to need to get access to. So I'm gonna quickly get under the car and pull the steering box. I'll move the lines out of the way and then we can check back in and see where we're at. Okay, so that's all had to tidy up now with a wire brush and a little bit of rust converter. You can see the significant part of the rust. It's down here at the bottom, exactly where it was on the other side. It's eaten all the way through the panel. You can see the movement there. Uh, the rest of it seems pretty good. Luckily down here on the chassis rail, it hasn't started to rust into that yet because there's three panels here. There's the chassis rail part, there's the strut tower part, and then there's the wheel arch area. And the strut tower is actually sandwiched between the chassis rail and the wheel arch. So trying to fix that bit would be a lot more difficult. So yeah, I'm just gonna cut along that line and we're gonna basically butt weld the strut tower into the existing bottom half of the strut tower and probably a little bit into the chassis rail so it should be plenty strong it may not be as neat but at the end of the day we're going to have lines covering that up so when i um sand it smooth and then paint the bay you won't notice it so from the inside you can see this is the wheel arch piece it's one piece goes all the way along the bottom and then you've got the chassis rail part and there's two parts there and then this internal strut tower piece but yeah definitely a hole there you can see right there i can put the screwdriver all the way through so let's get cutting okay so i just want to stop for a second and show you all of this stuff that's coming out here this is actually just um, sand. I know it looks like rust or something like that, but it's basically just where dirt has collected. And that dirt has collected in here and then got water in it. And this is what's rusted out this area so quickly um, and so, so localized as well. You know, if this was just general wear and tear, you'd expect rust much further up the strut tower and things like that. So obviously a weak point in the um, A chassis design 
but what I'm going to do here is just to show you guys, the metal under here is quite solid still. Um, there's no problems here. We're not, we're not covering up or hiding a problem. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just get in here now. This red stuff that you can see is the primer that was on the back of all of these panels when they were assembled. And I'm going to clean all this out with a wire brush, and then we'll see the uh, quality of the sheet metal underneath. Like I said, it feels very solid. Um, but, you know, before we put this back together, I just want to make 100%. If I do have to cut more of this out, I will. Um, but obviously, like to minimize the amount of new sheet metal I have to weld in. So let's get the brush on it and see where we're at. Okay, so if we move on down, you can see that there's plenty of good metal in there. There's a little bit of black spotting, which is the build up from the rust converter, the oxidized rust. And that hole there. Oh, that little guy. I wouldn't worry about that little guy. It's not actually rust. That was a spot weld that I didn't see. And basically I put a big screwdriver behind it and just pulled the metal out. <laughs> um, so that's fine. That'll actually just turn into a spot where I just plug weld the plate. So what I'm gonna do here is looking back across it, it looks pretty good. It just needs a coat of copper primer. And from there, I've cut out a piece of sheet metal, which is just gonna slip in along here. It fits nice and tight. There's really very minimal gaps. Now this has got a slight curve to it across here. So what I'm gonna do is just tack it from one side to the other, uh, to this piece first, and then to the bottom down here. Uh, and this will basically follow the curve. We don't have to worry about shaping the panel at all. It'll just, as I push this in and weld it and then let it go, it'll pull this out. So yeah, copper primer on the back of here now and also on the back of this piece. Uh, you'll see that I've ground both sides of this metal and I've put an arrow up. So obviously the arrow up, so I know the orientation, but basically once you get these in place, they're hard to sand anyway. Easier just to grind them off first so that you've uh, built a good habit for future pieces. And uh, yeah, I think this is gonna go in pretty easy. Okay, so before I get some primer onto this, uh, I just want to show you what it looks like in bare metal. So that was actually really hard to weld. I had much less room than I thought I was going to have when I was looking at it without my hands and a welding rod in the bay. But overall, it's come up pretty good. So there was a lot of top weld to grind down, but I did get reasonable penetration and have filled all the gaps. So if we take a look from the inside of the strut tower, it's much the same story, just a little less neat around things like this nut. Um, I mean, I can probably get a bit on a Dremel and get that out a little bit later and I may well do that. But uh, for now, that's gonna have to do. But what I am gonna do now is we still have this large gap. Now, obviously I don't wanna leave that there or it's just gonna have the same problem as it did last time. So I'm just gonna get a block of wood and put some pressure on this piece from the inside of the bay. What I'm gonna do then is just put some tacks on top of here to keep these two pieces of metal together. And then when I undercoat this whole area, what I'm gonna do is come in and just put some seam sealer all along these seams neatly. Uh, it won't obviously be factory, but I think this was an oversight. The way this is placed, I don't see any way this is not gonna rust out uh, on a standard car. So yeah, I'm just gonna get it as close as I can, button it up so it doesn't move around, and then seam sealer the whole way around and that'll keep that nice and closed up free from any water, debris, or air, and um, we'll be good to coat over the top of it and seal it up so it's good for another 
you know, 10, 20 years. So I'm gonna set up the camera now and we'll paint this inside of the bay. I'm not going to mask anything up down here. Everything's coming back out of this bay at some point to paint it, um, but it'll probably go over the pits like this. So it'll just be primed. And then because primer is porous um, and this area won't receive any more attention, I'm actually just gonna throw some clear coat over the primer. I'm not gonna worry about a color or anything because let's face it, we're not gonna match this and there's really no point in trying. So yeah, a bit of primer, a bit of clear coat and we should be good to go. Okay, so it's the next day. That paint is all dry now uh, and it's nice and protected. You may have noticed that I had to sand a little bit uh, during that little montage. Uh, the reason being is I put down the, um, the first coat of etch primer and obviously I want to use an etch primer because that is bare metal so a standard primer is not going to key into the surface enough. Um, so yeah, first coat of etch primer went on and it was all looking good. I gave it sort of five, 10 minutes to flash off. And then I came back to spray a second coat on um, and I sprayed export degreaser all over it uh, because these cans look very similar. So uh, yeah, I had to quickly wipe all that off with, um, with a microfiber towel, which means I ruined the uh, first coat of etch primer. Um, so yeah, it does look as neat as it should. Um, but it's certainly now coated in a couple of coats of etch primer and a couple of very thick coats of clear. Um, it's probably got runs in it. I haven't had a close look at it, but uh, uh, either way, it feels almost like a layer of plastic now. So nice and protected, shouldn't rust uh, before I get a chance to run through the engine bay properly and we actually repaint it the color of the car and all that sort of thing. So let's have a quick look at that. Um, and then we'll have to put all of those brackets and hoses and stuff back together. I'm not gonna put the steering box back in today because I've got something else planned for that. As you can see, everything's nice and coated. Uh, it's very shiny, it's not wet, it's just uh, a gloss clear that was over the top. Um, as I look a bit closer, there's a couple of runs in there, but uh, yeah, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, this just needs to be protected until we can sand it all back again and throw a final coat of body color over it. But the engine will have to be out to do that uh, and all of these lines and that will have to go as well. Okay, so we've got everything back in place now. You know, it doesn't look particularly neat or anything like that, but it looks pretty standard other than the uh, primered gloss paint underneath it. So, you know, we, we're protected under there, which is the main thing. And uh, I don't think this will cause me any problems uh, until we pull the motor and uh, do the rest of the stuff. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm calling that a win. Um, as I said, steering box isn't in and brake master is not on so that I have access to get to the steering box when I do need to put it back in. All right, so I think that's a massive win. Uh, look, just to explain why I'm sort of doing this a little bit piecemeal, um, I have gone through it before, but doing this project, A, I don't have a lot of room, so I have to move cars around a lot and it's actually really inconvenient for me to have Violet Crumbles up on jack stands at the moment and not be able to be moved in and out of the garage. Um, but also I think that if you can break a project down into 
stages that you can get through within, you know, maybe it's a three month or a six month period. Uh, and then, you know, get the thing back on its wheels, take it for a drive or whatever. It can keep you motivated. Uh, and I haven't done a project to this scale for a long time. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't get disheartened and just end up with a shell sitting in my garage for three or four years that I never really got back to. I'm also not sure whether it's gonna be able to go over the pits like this. So the WA inspection services can be a bit picky. So I think I'm gonna get pinged for things like not having a headliner in the interior and stuff like that. So I'll just have to see how I go. I'm hoping that I can drive it around looking as ghetto as possible for a little while with a beautiful brand new um, underbody to it and really safe and really all of the major boxes ticked, but looking like a bit of a rat rod. So uh, if I can, that is the plan. And during that time, we'll probably just jump onto a couple of other projects that I've got laying about. So before we finish up for today, if you remember in last week's episode, I was doing the tie rod ends and ended up having to buy a new bolt hardware. So yeah, this is the tie rod. I had to replace these bolts and nuts. Uh, if you remember, they were bent. Um, now, I got this from a local fastener shop and I, I said that, you know, I didn't have the fancy zinc coated bolts and things like that that looked like factory um, and I'd considered getting some. So I actually went out and did that. Um, in fact, I bought quite a few. I ended up getting five kits. And the first kit is neither zinc coated nor is it bolts. It is a 575 piece self-tapping screw kit. Uh, it's got standard pan head, black upside screws, Phillips drive, and a few uh, sort of quarter inch by the looks of things, hex head screws. Um, basically the first build that I ever did on a Celica, I had a lot of trouble trying to find screws that were black, for the especially for the interior and engine bay, that were of a sufficiently thick gauge without being too long. So this looks pretty good. Uh, I don't think I'll have any problems there. It's very basic. And then secondly, I got a panel bolt and nut kit. I actually got two of those. These are both the same. Um, that's just a 500 piece kit that have the spring washer and the panel washer already pressed onto the bolt itself. Now, one of the really great things about this, uh, if I look at the bolts that I've got here for the tie rod end, this is a M8 threaded bolt. But if I look at the head size on these with the micrometer, you're looking at basically a 13 mil head. Now the standard bolts were a 12 mil head. So if I grab an M8 out of here, at least these new ones are the correct head size. So 11.8, so that is good for a 12 mil spanner or socket. And if we take a standard Toyota M6 here, we've got a 9.96, so a 10 mil socket head. And on the M6s from the kit, we're looking at, there you go, 9.9. .9. So basically sizing is spot on with this. And if you look at those two bolts, they're almost an exact replica of each other. There's a little bit of difference here, but um, almost OEM, I would say. Probably not worth me getting a bunch of these off the car and having to sandblast them and then have them zinc coated and all that sort of thing. Now, some of the larger bolts are actually uh, stamped. They're 8.8 .8 tensile bolts. Uh, not everything in the kit is. In fact, the majority of it isn't, but there is some strong bolts there if you need them. The only little thing I've found with this kit is sometimes the color of the zinc is slightly different between bolts. So you can see this one's a little bit more pink, but it's not a big deal. You'd barely notice when they're on the car as far as I'm concerned. Then I got a kit that is specifically flange bolts and nuts. Uh, so flange bolts, this is a M10. Uh, and as you can see on the end, you have that cut flange all around the base of the bolt head, okay? So there's plenty of these on Celicas, and this is just a variety of those. Again, these ones are a lot more yellow than the rest of the ones in the kit, but again, minor variance in color isn't a big deal, uh, and we've got some flange nuts as well to go with it. Then finally, we just have a washer kit. So this is yellow zinc coated washers, there's spring washers and flat washers, and they range in size from an M6 up to an M12, I think. Yep, so that one has an internal diameter big enough for an M12 bolt. Not much to talk about there. The coloring is consistent, um, and they look pretty good. Just one last thing about the kits, though. So I got these off eBay from Workshop Supplies Online. 
Um, I just bought them off eBay like anyone would. I won't go through the costings for each of these because A, I don't recall what they were and B, uh, my girlfriend watches this channel and if she finds out how much I spent, she'll kill me. She showed me the knife. <laughs> but just one thing to remember on these is even though they were listed online as a kit to suit a turd of Celica, they're not a comprehensive kit built for an RA23 or an RA28. They are just a series of generic nuts and bolts and screws and things like that that are closely aligned with what you see on old school Japanese cars, right? There are gonna be bolts that I need for the car that I don't have in this kit, and there's probably gonna be a lot of extras that I may not end up using. So you need to figure out whether these are worth it for you. But for me, I think it's a simple way to move forward and a reasonable investment for what I've got. So yeah, plenty of bolts to finish this build off and probably a few more builds after that. So that just leaves us with where to next episode. And that is gonna be getting back under the car to pull off the exhaust and a few other bits and pieces uh, and figure out what we need to tidy up and finish up before we can get the undercoat on. And also I'm gonna take a look at that steering box because as I pulled it off, it felt a little notchy. Uh, so I wanna basically have a look at it and see if there's a way to fix it or whether or not I'm gonna to have to get it sent away and be rebuilt. So yeah, make sure you tune back in for that one. And if you haven't already and you enjoyed today's episode, just hit that like button down below so we can get some momentum going on these videos. Other than that, as usual, if you're new to the channel, you've got the full Violet Crumbles build here. And if you want to take a look at some of the A90 Super stuff that we're doing, we have that link down there as well. So thanks for watching The Build Room. I'll see you next time and bye for now.